somewhere. There it is. All these different parts of Zoom, they should be familiar by now and they're not, so oh well. Um, we're looking at uh, the second half of chapter 15 of the book of Romans today. Um, last week we talked about chapter 14 and, or the first part of chapter 15 and how uh, Paul was uh, laying himself before God as a servant of God. Uh, and uh, his desire really is a strong desire for the lost. And he talks about it here in the second half of chapter 15, beginning with verse 15. And, and he says, I, I'm writing these things to you by way of reminding you of how God has graciously dealt with me, though I ravished the church in the beginning. But Jesus has called me to serve by coming to all the nations, and again, that's the word to the Gentiles as the way it's normally translated uh, with the good news. And, and Paul starts this section of the scripture by talking about the grace of God. And, and who better in, in some ways to really understand uh, the grace of God? Um, there, there might be in one sense no one who has greater sin against God than, than Paul, even though he spent his whole life uh, early on trying to do what he thought God wanted him to do. He was doing it all by, by trying to be righteous in his own efforts to do the things that the law talked about. And, and, and that brought him to the point of saying, I'm going to go to Damascus. I'm going to destroy anybody who is living by this, uh, this way that people were talking about, which was following Jesus as the Messiah. And that was his, uh, his charge, his purpose in life at that particular point, to destroy anything related to Jesus until he got partway to Damascus and had this uh, revelation, uh, this uh, uh, experience where God spoke to him directly. And in the book of Acts, it says he, he said to the voice, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so Paul, persecuting the followers of Jesus, was actually persecuting Jesus himself because we are the body of Christ. And so he was feeling that, uh, that, that tension directly. And so uh, we've got this, uh, this situation where Paul, who is you could call the deepest of all sinners. And, and you could say then to any of your friends who are thinking that they're too bad to come to Christ, say, no, uh, Paul was the worst and, and we'll just let you know that you're not as bad as, as he was. And, uh, and God redeemed him and, and brought him into, uh, uh, in, into faith. And so uh, Paul in this deepest situation not only was saved by the grace of God, but he was then called by God <clears throat> to go out into the world and do a mess mission that not many other Jews wanted to do uh, because many of them stayed around Jerusalem and, uh, and uh, we can talk about uh, their life around Jerusalem of what we know from other parts of scripture, but, but all said and done, they didn't venture that far out. Some of the other apostles did, but, uh, but Paul was the one we know the most about in, in venturing out. So he's not only persecuting and trying to destroy the church and the, the, the ways of God, and then God turns around and says, okay, now I want you to go into all the world, and I want you to tell the world about uh, Jesus and your salvation. That major change he took, pl took place in his life is all by the grace of God. It's God willing to say, I know you were trying to kill me, but now I want you to go out into the world and help others come to know me. And, and so it was really kind of a, a special time for Paul to understand 
the, the grace of God uh, in his life and, and grace in such a way that he could teach it to us so that we uh, don't, don't feel like there's anything in our lives that we can't bring to God and have God redeem that uh, for us because of his, his great mercy. So um, the, the only other side of it is interesting when I was thinking about Paul and, uh, and his sufferings later on in life. You know, you wonder at some point whether there's a consequence for uh, what he did in the early part of his life. And so, you know, all that time in prison uh, could could have been a consequence for him but and learn what suffering really is all about. But uh, the other side of it, and, and I focus on this a lot, we would not know what we know about Christianity if it weren't for Paul being in prison and writing letters. Because had he not written those letters, we wouldn't know. And had he been, not been in prison, he probably would have never written the letters. He'd have just gone back and visited the church. And so we've got him in prison. Uh, and the grace of God is then extended to us that we get the benefit of everything that he learned as a, as a Jewish Pharisee being transformed uh, by God in his grace. And then all of a sudden we get the benefit of all of his writings. And so what a, what a benefit that has been, what a grace that has been to, to all of us. In verse 16, he goes on to say, I, I'm like a priest offering you all up to God through the good news that you might be set apart by the Spirit for his kingdom. My only ability to boast is found in what Jesus has done for me. All I want to talk about is what I have seen Jesus do in my life and how that message changed so many people throughout the world. I wonder... Uh, you know, after, I don't know, 50 years of, of following Christ, has it been, it's been that long or more? Um, when, when I came to Christ, one of the early things that I read was in John, uh, I believe it's chapter 10, where it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. And And I've always loved that passage because it, it just reminds me over and over again that I have opened up my life to let Jesus come in and work through me. And, and I, I'm still a sinner. I still stumble. I still do all kinds of things that probably ought not to do. But, but he works through me in ways that I least expect. And, and it just, uh, just fascinates me that I have to honestly look at my life and go, if it weren't for Jesus, none of this would happen. And, uh, and, and I think about uh, how, how great it's been at, as, a, as a father. And, and I've told you before, I'm, I'm an extreme introvert. I would have been happy having my life uh, hiding in a think tank someplace in my own quiet little office that people would give me ideas and I would think about and I would give them answers. Uh, and, and I just thought that would be the ideal life for me. And God turned around and said, oh, by the way, you need this really extroverted wife who is so totally different personality than you that it's going to drive you crazy, but you need her. And you're going to have four kids and you're going to have nine grandkids and you're going to have a house full of noise all the time. And, uh, and you know, I, I'm sitting there thinking, wow. Had I known that ahead of time, I would have run. Now that I look back on it, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because God knows what he's doing. And you became a pastor. <laughs> and I became a pastor when I, the last thing I wanted to do was stand up in front of people and talk. You know, and and God has God has been a blessing in the midst of all of that. I've learned more from the people of the church and from my kids and and from my wife than I uh, can imagine ever having learned hiding by myself in a small room in a think tank someplace. So uh, the the blessing of God 
uh, has called me to pretty much the same place where I, uh, I, I see Paul at at this particular point. I might have told you before, but a number of years ago, I found myself unemployed from the financial services world. And, and so I spent about uh, six months of my life wandering around trying to figure out what it was that uh, God was wanting me to do for the rest of my life. I, I read a great book called uh, What Color Is Your Parachute, if some of you might have read that, where it uh, led me through this journey of uh, developing my, my resume and what I wanted to do and who I wanted to, to be. And I gathered my four kids and my wife together and I said, I want you to sit down and I'm going to tell you these are the 10 things that I think I can do with the rest of my life and I want you to give me feedback. And so I went through this list of 10 things. I mean, people had offered me jobs and uh, without pay, you know, those kinds of jobs in the, in the Christian church and, uh, and a few other kinds of things. And uh, I, I got all the way to the end and I said, okay, so what do you think? And there was, you know, deathly silence amongst the group. And all of a sudden my oldest son turned around and said, well, dad, what do you want to do? What are you passionate about? What's important to you? And I said, all I want to do is tell people about Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and it just washed over me that, you know, nine of these uh, tasks that I thought I could do uh, weren't even important anymore. And that's when I uh, uh, went out to San Martin and became a, a pastor of uh, a relatively small church of 35 people. Matter of fact, one Sunday there was like five people in church, um, and uh, and it was a, a very small congregation. But uh, I stayed there for 13 years, and and it was because here was the opportunity God gave me to to talk to people uh, about Jesus. And so, uh, my only ability to boast is found in what Jesus has done for me, like Paul says here. Um, A question I suppose I can ask to you is um, something that came up in, gosh, this was 40 years ago now, in something about how do you have a testimony to tell somebody when you're in an elevator and you've only got, what, 30 seconds to talk to them, okay? And and the, the outline of your testimony is nice and simple. What's one thing in your life before you knew Christ that's different now? How is that different? And tell that person how Jesus has made a difference in your life. Nice and simple. That's, that's a 30-second testimony. This is what I was like. This is what I am like. And it's all because I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Um, and, and that's really the question, what's your story? What were you like beforehand? What are you like after conversion? This is the story of your life in Christ. And Paul said he can't do anything but tell that to other people. And hopefully that's true of you as well. Verse 19, he says, this has come about because of the work of the Holy Spirit through me. And that's the only way it's really going to happen in any of our lives. So that people from Jerusalem to Illyricum have heard the good news. And now I long to leave this all behind and go where no one yet has heard about Jesus to Spain. Okay. Um, It's probably, uh, you know, when he says he's he's come to this conclusion, it's probably a, a burning deep inside of him. Uh, that, uh, that, that he's compelled, he said, to preach the gospel. And, and he really wants to go to a place where nobody has ever heard the gospel. I was sort of preaching that when I came to uh, Santa Cruz and the church that I uh, ended up in was very interesting because shortly after I uh, was, uh, was pastoring there, I decided to do a sermon on the Bible because nobody there seemed to be too concerned about the Bible. And uh, sure enough, after about six weeks of talking about the benefits of 
of scripture reading and teaching and so forth and so on. Somebody called me up and took me out to lunch and said, uh, you know, I, I think it's time to stop talking about the Bible and talk about something else. And, you know, if, if I can't talk about what the scripture says and how I understand it, I, I don't have anything worth, uh, worth talking about. Amen. Amen. But um, the, the question still comes back to us is who are the ones that Paul was going to see, the people of Spain, who are the unchurched in our lives, those who have never heard? Uh, and, and I only remember a statistic from when I was in Woodlake between 1978 and 1985. I kept running into people in that community who had never in their life been inside of a church. Wow. That was... I don't know, do the math, almost 40 years ago. Uh, and and there, were, there were quite a few people in that community who had never been inside of a church, not in a Catholic church, not in a church for a funeral, not in a church for a wedding, uh, not in a Sunday school. They'd never been to church. And I can imagine if we asked those questions in Santa Cruz today, uh, that number would, would be astronomical of the number of people who've never crossed the path of the church. And so in one sense, we have no reason to go to Spain, okay? We can just go in our neighborhood and go into the community in which we live and find plenty of people who have never heard about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Or we're gonna find a lot of people whose foundation of what they've heard about Jesus is all wrong because they've been taught wrong as time has gone on. And they've heard about Jesus from the media and they've heard about Jesus from people who are unhappy uh, with the church and they've heard about Jesus from places that might not be the good foundation that we have learned over time. The grace of God has come to each one of us for a purpose. And that purpose is partly the salvation or the forgiveness of our sins that we have. But part of it is so that we can be his instruments to draw other people to Jesus. So who are the people around you who don't know Jesus or don't have a good foundation? I'm going to suggest that you pray God would open a chance for you to speak to them. Pray at the same time that the Holy Spirit would give you words to say. What, what's your testimony? What, what was your life like before? What is it like now? And how has Jesus been the reason for that change? And pray that you too could be a missionary uh, in, amongst your circle of acquaintances. Uh, I remember the book, oh gosh, this was a long time ago, God's smuggler. smuggler. Yes. Um, there was one part in that book where somebody came up to him and said, I really want <clears throat> to, to do what you do. I, I want to be called by God to, to go out into the world and smuggle Bibles and tell people about Jesus. And, and he, he reacted to that by saying, yeah, it's fascinating to me how many people want to go live my life <laughs> yeah. when when I have to, you know, drive, what was he? He was driving an old Volkswagen, and he had like 150,000 miles on it. He'd never changed the oil. He'd never, he, he'd never done anything to it. He had no mechanical ability, never changed the tires, nothing. God just kept it running. And, and he would smuggle Bibles in the back of the, the car and, and those kinds of things. He would say, why in the world would you want to go through what I go through when you've got a mission field right next door in your backyard and in your town? But I'm compelled to go here. Why don't you just take a step out your door and go visit the mission field that's around you? Who is it? that you can feel compelled to care for? Who, who is it that God is putting into your heart to, to speak to? Who's your Spain? 
What's your calling? Uh, I think that the more we can trust God, pray that he would ask you to lead us in some way, the more we can open up ourselves and our lives to people around us and share with them the love of Jesus that we have found, the more the kingdom of God will grow. Turn to hymn number 415. I want us to sing, He giveth 